Hello everybody, this is David Panush of the Edmund Burke School and I am coming to you with a video lecture on habits and this lecture is basically a summary of some of the big ideas from Good Habits, Bad Habits by Wendy Wood who's a psychologist out in California. I can't remember which, USC, UCLA, one of those. Um, and I'm hoping that you can use this video lecture to help you think more about how you can use some of these ideas to create better habits. And the most important thing I think to start off with is just the idea that habits are extremely powerful. Habits are stronger than willpower. Um, and the big idea here is that habits are system one. And we've learned previously about system one versus system two. And system two is just easier. Um, and so when you can automate your desired behaviors, that gets you um, much better to where you want to go versus trying to use willpower and, and self-control and like white knuckling your way to the things you want to do. A lot of our habits are also just like all system one behaviors below the level of our consciousness. So we do things over and over and over again without actually being aware, which is also where habits can be a danger because we do a lot of things badly or that aren't good for us without thinking, without system two consciousness. So apparently 43% of our behaviors we perform out of habit. So if we can use habits, create good habits, that's awesome because we automate the good stuff and become more aware of the bad habits and reduce them. That's awesome because there's it's sort of this um, big thing hanging out that we don't know that we're doing that isn't so great. Um, so let's look at what's called the habit loop and a couple different folks have created um, different versions of this but more or less um, the first thing that happens is the cue okay or the context it's a trigger something that signals you to begin the habit and so in this you know in many cases it might be like it's the first thing that happens but in a bigger idea it's the call of the context around the habit too there can all be cues so you might say like Waking up in the morning is a cue to do all kinds of other things, but like how your room is set up, how your house is set up, what time it is, those are all parts of the cues in the context which could trigger a good or a bad habit. Then the behavior happens, the routine that you get into, right? And the thing about habits, of course, is that we repeat them, and the more we repeat them, the more they become habitual. System one without thought as opposed to... Um, you know, system two where you're building it. Um, so the behavior happens after the cue, the cue cues the behavior, the context triggers the behavior, then we have the routine that we go through, which, and it could even be an emotional routine, right? That's sort of a thing there. But then we get some kind of feedback from our brain. And uh, it could be <laughs> um, that, that some kind of comfort or some kind of reward or some kind of excitement happens and that tells your brain do this again right this is this is worth doing again and it begins you begin to associate the reward the reward with the cue not just the routine so then the cue all by itself can be the thing that sets off the behavior without thinking about it so keep this this loop in mind as we go through um, the first part of the loop is context or cues. And one way to think about it, I think that I like that um, Dr. Wood talks about in the book, is there are either forces that stop you from doing things or there are forces that drive you to do things. So you've kind of got driving forces and restraining forces. And those could be driving forces or restraining forces on good habits or bad habits. So what are the things that make it harder to act that are in your way? You might remove some of those things to make it easier to do what you want to do. Um, but there are also things that make it easier to act. Those are driving forces. What could you get more driving forces and reduce the restraining forces for things you want to do and vice versa. So if you've got a bad habit, you want to increase the restraining forces and reduce the driving forces. So let's talk about some of the um, big categories in terms of the driving forces and restraining forces. And these are all cues and context that you begin to associate with the behavior that becomes the habit. So proximity, is a big one basically how and this is one of the easiest ones to manipulate so how close is the chocolate to your hands if you want to cut down on how much you eat chocolate the best thing to do is not be near the chocolate right so don't get it in the house at all or don't go to the store um, to buy the thing that's going to put you in right next to the chocolate um, right we so there's been plenty of studies that show for instance that people who live closer to gyms actually use the gym more 
right? So if, if, if that's really important to you, then you need to make sure that, that you are um, you know, putting yourself in proximity to the things you want and taking yourself out of proximity to the things that you don't. Um, the time of day, which is really important. Um, it can be one of the most important factors in your context or cue. And the more consistent all these things are, the more likely the habit is to form. Now again, habits can be good or bad, so keep that in mind. Um, sculpting your environment, in sort of, maybe it's a little more general, but the thing about changing your environment is that you only have to do it once, right? You do it once, you actually, once your environment is shaped, you don't need to keep doing it over and over again. And that's a real big win from your brain's perspective because again, it's sort of going back to proximity. If I don't have chocolate in the house, I've sculpted the environment so that I don't have to continually make the choice not to eat the chocolate that's on my desk. So I wouldn't put candy on my desk if I'm trying not to eat candy. Um, the greatest source of, of influence on us is the people around us. And so a big part of our context could be friends. We see a certain friend and we kind of fall into a certain habit or certain pattern, right? Some friends and some relatives are going to encourage us in good habits or in bad habits or keep us from good habits or bad habits. So surrounding yourself with people that will help you do the things you want to do and hinder you from doing the things you don't want to do is a big way to think about context and cue to your advantage. All right, so once we have the cue or the context and the trigger, we have the behavior. And the behavior, the key here is repetition. The brain learns from repetition, okay? So as, if we can keep the cues stable over and over and over again, we're more likely to form the habit. Um, consistency forms the habit. Variability will disrupt the habit. And that, again, if it's something you want to disrupt, you need to think of disrupting, so then you don't want as much consistency. But on average, um, I don't know if this is encouraging or discouraging, but it takes 65 days um, through some scientific studies to form a new habit. It depends on the habit, it depends on the person. Some habits can be formed more quickly than others. Um, and the good news in terms of this habit formation research is that you don't, although we shoot for consistency, if you are getting most of your time the same every day, doing the same thing, and you skip a few days, you can still form the habit. It's, it's not all or nothing. You want to be close to, as close to repetition and consistency as possible, but if you miss a few, you can still form the habit. Finally, in that habit loop, we get rewards. The rewards tell the brain to do this again. It's hits of dopamine, right? They don't last very long, but they do form connections in your brain that tell you do this again and it associates the reward with the cue. Now if you're trying to form a new habit you want to think about how can I create rewards that are kind of big and better than the mundane and normal rewards that I get on a daily basis. Um, another way of doing this and this sort of you have to balance this with the consistency thing um, you want variable rewards because you do tend to get used to things. In other words, the bigger and better part of the reward will go down if you have the same reward every single time. So introduce a little bit of surprise or variability into your rewards makes the rewards good. So keep the, keep the, the cues the same, keep the habit, the behavior the same, but maybe mix up the rewards a little bit. Um, and in terms of rewards, you want those rewards as close as possible to the habit. In other words, your brain won't make the association. That's why long-term positives are tougher than in terms of forming a new habit. So exercise might be good for me 30 years from now, but that reward is too far away. I need a reward as close as possible to the habit so my brain forms the association at that moment between the reward and the habit, which is why short-term behaviors with, that have short-term gains form habits much more easily, and a lot of those are actually bad behaviors. So we've got to use that same mechanism to form better habits or to get rid of um, bad ones. And if possible, intrinsic um, rewards are better uh, and more long-lasting. Um, you get feelings of pleasure and satisfaction from the behavior. That can really be a good way to form the habit. So, and for example, um, your own beliefs about the behavior can affect how you feel about it, and that can be the reward. So if you believe exercise is fun, or if you do exercise that you think you'll like, then you will enjoy it, and then that's the reward, and then your brain makes the association between exercise and fun, and you'll be much more likely to keep doing it. All right, so some other things. Um, stacking, swapping, stress, and new situations. So let's talk about each one real quickly. And these are all based on research from the book. Um, so stacking is an interesting one because it seems kind of like 
take advantage again of the mechanism that already exists. You probably already have some habits, many of which are probably good. If you can stack a new good habit right after a current good habit, it'll be easier because you're already doing the first habit. So if you're already brushing your teeth every day, stacking flossing on top is much better, is much easier than finding a new time of day and a new context for doing your flossing. And they've actually studied this. So they asked people to floss after brushing for a month and they asked other people to floss before brushing for a month and the after brushing people had much better success rate even eight months later because it was a habit stacked onto a, an existing habit. Swapping is basically saying, can I take, can I swap out uh, a bad behavior for a good behavior, but keep everything else the same so the cues and the rewards will be the same. So I used to go outside to, to smoke a cigarette um, and that was the behavior, but instead I'm gonna go outside and do something else, uh, a better habit, go for a walk or meet with a friend, um, talk to my best friend or listen to my favorite music. So maybe when I get the cue that makes me wanna go outside and smoke a cigarette or vape or whatever it is kids are doing these days, um, instead of vaping, I'll do this other thing that gives me much the same reward and I keep all of the same habit loop the same, but I swap out the bad behavior for the good one. Um, stress in general will reinforce habits. It could reinforce a good habit or it can reinforce a bad habit, but just keep in mind that, that it's a reinforcing factor. Lastly, a new situation, and here we are, I'm, I'm providing in this class a sort of artificial new situation. It's also um, happens to be near a new year. So, and we're in a global pandemic, which is what that icon is about. So all of that has disrupted our situ our regular routines, right? Our regular habits and that's actually an opportunity to think I could form new habits. I could form new contexts, new cues, new rewards, etc. Um, so keep keep that in mind as an option. It's why New Year's resolutions are a thing even though they're not super successful. But but starting anew does have a long history in humans and it works pretty well. Um, so the last thing I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Um, Acting on habits as opposed to um, using you know, your willpower all the time actually can free your system to, your conscious mind, to focus on other tasks. You can sort of offload all of the, the things you want to do to the easy stuff, which is system one. And keeping track and cultivating good habits um, is a natural and effective path to being calm, to being relaxed. If you know that your patterns are good patterns, then they take care of themselves and you can be calm. Um, Self-control is not about willpower. It is not about white knuckling. It actually can be about creating these habits so that you can succeed without willpower at all. So it's sort of a magic trick if you think about it. All right, so if you have any questions, please let me know and I look forward to seeing you.